You know, uh, I did not do, this is going to be a shock to some of you who know me, but uh, I did not do a whole lot of reading as a middle schooler. When I was growing up, I, I wasn't tearing through books all the time, but uh, I remember distinctly one book that I could not put down. Um, and it's not the Bible, that's not the, where this illustration is going, uh, but it's this book here. It's called Jesus Freaks, DC Talk, and the Voice of the Martyrs. And I've expressed my genuine love for DC Talk to you all before, but that's not why I love this book. And I don't know who in the right minds let me pick up this book as a 12-year-old, but whoever it was, I'm glad that they did because this book left a huge impact on my heart. It's a book that recounts stories of Christians who were tortured and beaten and killed for the name of Jesus. And I remember reading these stories as a kid and even thinking back as an adult. They were so hard to read at times. They were so difficult why did this have to happen? Why do believers go through this sort of thing? And that's just part of life in the sacred overlap. It's part, for, for many Christians, it's part of living faithfully as Jesus' disciple while we wait for his return, like we've been talking about in the sermon series. And I remember reading these stories as a kid, and I would always have this nagging question, man, what would I do if it were me in that situation. Have you ever wondered about that? What would I do if I was under intense persecution? How would I respond if it was my family that was at risk, if it was my life that was on the line? And it can be really inspiring to read these stories of people who, who kept their eyes on Jesus in the midst of just intense persecution but it can also be really humbling to, to turn inward and wonder if we would do the same. And without question, uh, the Apostle Paul is one of these guys who has an incredible and inspiring story of enduring in the face of opposition. And we've been reading one of his letters that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica as a part of this sacred overlap series. And as we continue to read today, I believe that there's a way for us to get an idea of how we might respond to the kind of opposition that Paul was facing. Because in our text today, Paul is going to talk about his trip to Thessalonica. He's going to talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding it, and he's going to give us a window into his heart and his, and his life and into what made the difference for him. And so if we're able to see what was so motivating and so compelling to the Apostle Paul, I'm wondering if we too might be able to catch that vision for living in the sacred overlap and live faithfully no matter what happens. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to be we're going to be reading uh, seven verses 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we'll start in verse 1. And as we're reading and as we're looking at what made the difference for the Apostle Paul. Before we read, um, I, I titled this sermon, What is Your Why? Because what Paul is giving us a window into, what made the difference for him was the motivation that he had. It was the why behind all the things that he was doing in his life. And so as we read, we'll, we'll see if we can discover what Paul's motivation is, and we'll see if we can catch that vision as well. So if you've got 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, go ahead and stand up with me to honor the word of God. And we'll read starting in verse 1. Paul writes, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. 
We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or from anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. You may be seated. So our passage this morning, it breaks down into two kind of sections. The first one is in verses one and two, where Paul recounts his coming to Thessalonica. And then the second is in verses three through seven, where he takes up one of his main purposes in the letter of 1 Thessalonians, which is to defend his ministry. It's to clarify his motives during the time when he was in Thessalonica. And so now we've already begun to hear about the context and the background for this passage as Jim has been preaching. But I want to, I want to review just real quickly. So up here, we have the city of Philippi, which Paul mentions in our text. And he says, you know, we were treated outrageously in Philippi. We've already heard how Paul was beaten and unlawfully imprisoned in Philippi. And that then he escaped that uh, imprisonment and that persecution. And he brought the gospel to Thessalonica. But what's interesting is that when we read in the book of Acts, Paul didn't fare a whole lot better in Thessalonica because after he was ministering for a short time, some of the citizens of Thessalonica, they, they, uh, they drummed up a, a crowd and a riot to come and basically run Paul out of town. And so before too long, opposition came again, and Paul and his companions had to leave to go to the next town to preserve their lives and continue to share the gospel. But, but what I want to point out in our text is these phrases that Paul keeps using. He's saying, you know, brothers and sisters. And then later on, he says, we were outrageously treated in Philippi, as you know. And then a third time later on, he says, you know, we never used flattery. Over and over again in these seven verses, Paul is appealing to his audience and their memory of him. And as scholars have looked at the rhetoric that Paul's using and this appeal that he's making, they've concluded that, Likely, after Paul was gone, people came to this new church, these young believers, and they tried to discredit Paul. They tried to sow doubt about what Paul was really up to when he was preaching the gospel in Thessalonica. And they started comparing him to other men that would travel around and just spout, you know, philosophies and religion and act as holy men. Uh, All of the commentaries that I read called these guys charlatans. And so I looked in vain to find a better English word than charlatans. So that's the one I'll use. But uh, these charlatans were basically the first century equivalent to con artists and scammers. They would roll into town. They would try to get people to like them. They would say whatever they needed to say. And then they would leave with everybody's money. And so you can see how since Paul spent a short time in Thessalonica and since he had to skip town when things got really intense so that he could take the gospel to the next city, you can see how people might have come in and said, see, he didn't really care about you. Don't listen to what he said. If he was the real deal, he would, he would still be here. He's just another one of those charlatans, one of those guys who's in it for themselves. And so when Timothy brings back news of this opposition to Paul, Paul writes the letter that we're reading. And in an attempt to convince the Thessalonians that he really does care about them, he does a couple of things. And the first thing that he does is he appeals to his track record with suffering. He appeals to his time in Philippi. And he says, you know I was publicly beaten and mistreated in the last city. If I was in this for myself, I would have given up a long time ago. So what we see is that Paul brings up his time in Philippi, he brings up his track record with suffering because he knows that how we respond to suffering says a lot about what motivates us. How we respond to suffering says a lot about what motivates us. And so we've been hearing in this series a little bit about the kinds of opposition that are present in our world today because even though it's not the exact same as the stuff that Paul was dealing with, there's opposition to the gospel in every day and age. How how have we responded to that opposition? What does that say about what's motivating us in our actions as we live in this life? Because for us, 
what this means is that we, we can begin to discern how we will respond in the future to opposition based on what is really motivating us right now. We, we, can, we can have an idea about how we might respond if we were the person in the story of the Voice of the Martyrs based on what has captured our heart today. And so in the words of our series, you know, we've been talking about how we've got these two spheres and they overlap and that's the sacred overlap. We're in the middle of that. But, but in the words of our series, if our hearts and our minds and our imaginations and our motivation, if that's all caught up in the sphere of the world, then that's going to yield a very different response to suffering and opposition than if our hearts and our minds and our imaginations and our self-concept and who we understand ourselves to be is, is coming from the truth of the gospel. And so I want to point out as well that Paul's not just writing this letter to clear his name. He's not just writing it so that, you know, he can maintain his reputation. Paul's also writing the letter to the Thessalonians so that he can set an example for them because he knows, having left them, the kind of opposition that they're still going to face as they're trying to live faithfully in the sacred overlap. And so he puts his motives on display. He leans in to this contrast because he doesn't want the Thessalonians to give up, even though it's getting hard. And so he, he puts his heart out there so that they can see his example and not give up. And I want the same thing for us today as we look at Paul's example. And so following Paul's example, if we want to live faithfully as Jesus' disciples while we wait for his return, we, we need to start paying attention, not just to what it is that we're doing, whether or not we think we're doing the right thing, but also why we're doing it. We need to ask that question, what is your why? And so next what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 3 through 7 and we're going to look at this contrast that Paul leans into between himself and these other charlatans who were in it for themselves. And as we do, as we look at these motivations side by side, I want you to be asking yourself, which is a better description of me? Am I more like Paul, who's motivated by the sphere of Jesus and the gospel? Or am I more like these charlatans who are motivated by, who, whose hearts are captured by the sphere of this world? So, why is Paul doing what he's doing? Well, in verse 3, that's where he goes next. He says, you know we were treated outrageously in Philippi, and he says, but we, we endured in the midst of much opposition. Why, Paul? Why did you do it? For, he's about to tell us, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor were we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God. Really what Paul's doing is he's stating the contrast, and he states it three different times. The first contrast is between the appeal that springs from error and impure motives, and he says, on the contrary, we're those uh, who have been approved by God and trusted with the gospel. And then again in verse four, he kind of restates the contrast. We're not trying to please people, but God. And then in verses uh, six and seven, he restates it again. But uh, really the heart of the contrast, I think, can be seen in this one line. Paul's saying, we weren't trying to please people. We were living for God. And so on the one hand of the contrasts, when our hearts and our minds are captivated by the world, Paul's saying, we're, we're essentially people pleasers. This is his description of the charlatans, these people that he's being compared to. And yet we know that the charlatans, they weren't just in it to you know, get people's approval in a friendly kind of a way. They had these ulterior impure motives. And so you can write down that when our hearts and our minds are captured by the sphere of the world, we're motivated by a selfish desire, often for approval. We, we have these ulterior motives where we're trying to get something for ourselves. And Paul's saying a lot of the times that that plays itself out in a desire to please people, in a desire to garner approval. And so Paul fleshes out this motivation by showing some of the ways that these people would act. And so first of all, he says, or he implies, that uh, these charlatans, when, when we're motivated by a selfish desire for approval, number one, we give up in the face of opposition. 
we give up in the face of opposition. A charlatan who's just trying to win people over for selfish reasons doesn't care enough about his message, doesn't care enough about his mission to undergo hardship. This kind of person reminds me of the hired hand that we read about yesterday in our church devotions in John chapter 10. Jesus is talking about this person. He says, the hired hand is not the shepherd. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. What's interesting is if you look at the hired hand from afar, he, he looks like he cares about the sheep, right? He's got his staff, he's got his rod, he's standing by the sheep, he looks like he's guarding them. He, he looks like he cares about the sheep, but in reality, he's just in it for himself. He's just in it to make a quick buck. And the thing about this selfish desire for approval is that it can seem at first glance like we're focused on other people because we want them to like us. But in reality, we're just focused on ourselves. I don't really care about you. I just care about what I think I can get from you. This sense of approval, this sense of validation that I'm looking for. I don't care about you. I just care about what I can get from you. And haven't we all had interactions with people like that? One funny example I thought of was when I'm driving down the grocery aisle with my cart and there's somebody in the aisle going, how much do you pay for your electric bill, right? That, they do that whole thing with the mall kiosk kind of a situation. It's like, and I appreciate what they're trying to do, but like you don't actually care about how much I pay for my electric bill. You care about getting a sale that goes on your record because of the incentive structure that's going on, right? It's like th their appeal is not based in brotherly love. It's, you know, they don't hate me, but like, they don't actually care about me. They care about what they can get from me. And, and we've interacted with people like this, and we've treated people like this too. And if you don't think you have, it's because you've never gotten an order wrong at McDonald's. Because like, missing out on a 20-piece nugget flips people out. Like People go absolutely insane. It's so easy for us to flip a switch across the window between like a cordial interaction and like you better give me what I think I deserve or else there's going to be problems. You know what I mean? Like people will get out of their cars, they'll march into McDonald's. Like we, like we, we are so quick to objectify people when, when they're not giving us what we think we deserve out of the interaction. We can do it to fast food employees. We can do it to waiters and waitresses. But we can do the same exact thing to our, to our spouses and to our kids. We can, we can treat them like they're only good for what they can provide for us. And the problem with treating people this way is that as soon as I realize I can't get what I want, I'm gone. I'm out of there. Because, because it's a motivation that's not coming out of genuine love for this person it's a motivation that's coming from me being the center of my universe. We, we put ourselves at the center of things and we interpret all of our relationships and interactions through the lens of whether or not it's gonna help me get what I want. And so since I'm really at the center of my world, I value my personal safety over you. So if, so if things are gonna heat up, I'm out of here. I leave. And I either leave physically like the charlatans in the first century or we can leave emotionally and just get cold and distant and irritable and frustrated and vengeful. It's so easy to just treat people like they're only good for what they can provide for us. Because at the end of the day, when our hearts and our minds are captured by the sphere of the world, I care more about myself and my needs and what I can get than I do for the people around me. So that, that's the first thing. And so, so they, they flee in the midst. They give up in the face of opposition. The second thing that Paul mentions as a part of this contrast is in verse five. He says, you know we never used flattery, but the charlatans sure do. The charlatans use flattery all the time because when we're motivated by a self-centered desire for approval, we turn to things like flattery. And flattery is just the dishonest use of words in order to manipulate people into giving us what we want. It's the dishonest use of language and rhetoric, often for personal gain. In the lives of, of the charlatans of the first century, 
This meant catering your message so that people would give you what you want, right? The, the truth doesn't matter to you. You're not actually like believing what you're saying. You're just trying to say whatever you can to get the money or the fame or the women or whatever it is. They don't actually care about the truth. They care about themselves. And so at, at first, flattery, I, I don't know, when I look at it, when I look at it, I'm like, I don't know, is that really, is that really, do I flatter people? Is that, is that something that really applies to my life? It, it might not seem like something that we, that we deal with on a daily basis, but I want us to, to take pause and look a little closer. B- because you notice that when Paul talks about himself, he says, I'm one who has been entrusted with the gospel. And for those of us who claim Jesus, we've been entrusted with the gospel as well. And so we we may not consider ourselves traveling teachers and philosophers, but because we have been entrusted with the gospel, we have a responsibility to live as an intentional evangelist. We talk about that in the Christ acronym. And while we may not be actively preaching a false gospel, oftentimes, I mean, how many of us are content to shy away from the truth in order to gain approval from other people? How many of us are willing to to leave Jesus out of a conversation that we know he ought to be in in order to avoid an awkward silence? See, we're, we're not as likely maybe to use our words actively to try to garner approval, but we're very willing to use our silence. And what I want to propose to you today is that our silence And that use of language and words can be just as manipulative as the words of the charlatans in the first century. We're trying to gain the praise and the approval of our peers, and we're just using silence to get it instead of words. Because when deep down we're motivated by a selfish desire for approval, the truth of the gospel isn't as important to us as being seen as acceptable by society. A third thing that Paul uses that he talks about along these lines, when when our hearts and our minds are captured by the sphere of this world, when we're motivated by a self-centered desire for approval, he says, you know we never put on a mask to cover up greed, but you've seen it a million times before. The charlatans that come into town, this is exactly what they do. And I like the way that the NIV translates this, putting on a mask to cover up greed, but what does that mean? You know, what what are they trying to get at? Uh, The NLT translates it in a way that's a little easier to understand. They say, we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. So so Paul is trying to distance himself from this idea that he was being false to the Thessalonians in order to get something from them. That that he was just putting on a front, that he he was hiding his true motives so that they would give him money and praise and all that kind of thing. But the reason I like the the language that the NIV uses is because the idea of putting on a mask reminds me of the image of performing for people. And that's something that really resonates with me. In the context of the first century, the charlatans would do this all the time. They They would pretend to have the answers. They would pretend to like you. They would pretend to serve you in order to get something from you. There aren't, they aren't being genuine. They're just performing. And so when we're motivated by a selfish desire for approval, we perform for people rather than really loving them. Now, my guess is that of the, you know, however many people are in this room today, a very low percentage of us are are probably literally trying to pretend to be people's friends in order to get their money. If you are, please don't. You know, you can come up and see me after service if you'd like. Uh, but, But I would... I would suggest that every single one of us has some element of performance in our lives. Performance happens when we do something outwardly in order to appear a certain way, in order to get some kind of a desired outcome. It happens when we do something externally so so that we look a certain way, so that something else happens. So ask yourself, When I'm serving in the church or outside of the church, am I thinking about whether or not people are seeing me serve? Am I willing to serve in secret or or am I just serving so that people see me so that they think I'm a good Christian? 
am I serving my family because I, I, I genuinely love them and I, and I want to I wanna live into my responsibilities as a dad and as a, as, a, as a husband? Or am I just doing what I think I need to do so that they think that I'm a good dad? Do you see, it's a subtle difference here. Am I listening to my friends share their heart with me because I love them and I don't wanna be there to support them? Or do I wanna support them so that they think that I'm a good friend so that I feel better for myself? Like, do, do you see the subtle performative element there? That, that we're not actually doing it out of a genuine spirit. It's that, that genuine spirit of serving and loving people is clouded by this desire for them to see us in a certain way. And, and so we, we perform rather than really loving people. And when our acts are just an attempt to get people to view us in a certain way so that we can feel better about ourselves, so that we can sleep at night, we're falling into the trap of thinking that we can act a certain way, that we can do all the right things rather than actually being transformed inwardly. And the tragic thing to me is, is that when I spend all of my time in conversation with you thinking about whether or not you're thinking that I'm a good pastor or a good husband or a good friend, that internal dialogue that I'm having, it's taking me away from being actually present with you. It's like we can't, we can't really be present with one another when we have this separate track going on in our minds that's distracting us from the people around us. When my heart is caught up in the world, I rob myself from the ability to really see and love those around me. I'm at the center of my universe, and I just care about what I think I can get from you. And so I'm constantly not present with you because I'm trying to rig the situation. I'm trying to put on a mask to try to get a desired outcome. Now, should we stop doing good things, you know, because there's that performative element? No, like good things are good. You should do them. Uh, don't stop serving your spouse. Don't stop listening to your friends because Clay preached a sermon, right? Um, but we need to recognize that our motivations are often mixed, that, that we're not we're not so one-sided as we can think that we are. And that if we're not careful, we can find ourselves looking so good and so Christian on the outside while we're just running on empty internally. There can be this huge gap between the way that we want others to perceive us and what's actually going on in our hearts. We can look like we're in the sacred overlap but in reality, our hearts and our minds are still, they're, they're still in the world. They're still captured by the world. And see, part of the reason that examining our motivations is so important is because we all live with legitimate needs and desires. And our deepest need and desire is to be known and loved by God. We have these desires for other people to approve of us, for other people to think of us in a certain way. And those aren't inherently wrong, but they're all pointing to this, to this hole in our hearts where we need to be known and loved by God. That is the most important need and desire that we have. That's what we were created to live in, and yet because of sin, we're separated from God, but that need does not go away. That, that hole in our hearts is still there. That aching emptiness that we feel inside, it doesn't go away. And so when we're living in the sphere of this world, and when our heart is there, we spend our days trying to dull that need, trying to medicate it away, trying to, to rig any situation that we can for someone to think that we're a good person. And so we, we, we take and we idolize stuff. We, we try to shove it into the hole of our hearts, but it doesn't work and it just leaves us empty on the other end. And everything becomes about me and this emptiness that I feel, and I will do just about anything to fill it. And so we try to fill it, or we try to distract ourselves from it with drugs and video games and, and all, these, all these idols in our lives. We reach for anything within grasp in the sphere of the world. But nothing will satisfy that deep sense of emptiness that we feel. And so when we're motivated by these self-centered desires, we're just living in order to be filled. <clears throat> We're just trying to 
fill that gap that we sense so profoundly. We become like this human vacuum cleaner, like this human black hole of need. And rather than following those needs and that emptiness to their conclusion, we stop short. And we we try to use people to fill that gap when they never can. And the sad thing is, is that we will never really be free to love people in our lives as long as we need them to love us back. We'll never be really free to serve in self-sacrifice for the people around us as long as we need them to respond to us in a certain way for us to feel okay inside. Pastor Jim says it like this sometimes. When we try to love with our human love, we end up hurting people because our human kind of love is inherently self-centered. But we don't don't have to live that way. We, We don't have to live with that constant emptiness inside of us. Let's go back to the text because, because Paul did not live that way. Paul was not trying to do the dance to get the hug. He wasn't trying to perform in order to get something in return. And so let's see what made the difference for Paul. Back in our text, we read, uh, this is kind of what I pointed out as the center, you know, a good summary of this contrast that Paul is making. He says, we're not trying to please people, but please God. And and that's that's true, right? That's part of the contrast. But my fear is that when we read that, we, we think to ourselves, okay, so I get it. When we live in the sphere of the world, when we're, when we're captured by that, then we're trying to perform for people so that people like us. And what the apostle Paul is saying is that if we're, if we're captured by Jesus, then we're just going to perform for Jesus so that Jesus likes us. But that is not the contrast that Paul is trying to make here. Do you see the problem in that? Do you see the danger in that? I don't believe Paul is trying to please God in the sense that he's working really hard to try to make sure that he's good enough for God. But we do that all the time. I do that all the time. I fall into it. I fall into viewing my Christian walk and the Christian life like this long race. And if I just run hard enough, if I just do enough of the right things, then maybe at the end of my life, God will look at me and he will say that he loves me and he will give me that, that, that love and that approval that I so desperately long for. And we quote those verses from Jesus's parable and we say, I just want to get to the end of my life and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And those words are so beautiful. It's such a, it's such a breathtaking thought that God would speak those words over us. But I want to point out that in that version of Christianity, in that version of Christianity where I'm just trying to perform for God so that he gives me the love that I so desperately need, we are still at the center of the universe. Our life is still all about us. I'm running and I'm trying really hard because I want God to love me and I want God to approve of me and I want to feel better about myself and I just want to get rid of this emptiness that I feel inside but it's still all pointed back to me and my needs and what I think I want. If my whole life is just a performance trying to please God, then I'm just using God to feel better about myself rather than using people. And that's not how Paul lived. That's not the motivation that he's modeling for us. Just in the sentence before, he's not trying to run in order to please God. He's saying, we speak as those who have been approved by God. Do you see the difference here? It's not a future tense thing. It's not something that he's waiting for. It's something that he knows is true about him right now. He is living as someone who has received God's approval. He isn't hoping to get to the end of his life and do well enough for God to be pleased with him. Friends, we don't have to wait until we're dead for God to love us. We don't have to wait for our life to be over for God to smile genuinely when he looks at us. 
that's not the good news of the gospel. That is such a shadow of what Jesus died to make available to us. And if that were the case, if our only hope is in our performance, then none of us have a shot. We are hopelessly lost and we're left alone in our emptiness. But the reality is that God's approval is the only approval that matters. And it's the only approval that we don't have to work for. That the love of God, that when he smiles at us, that is the one thing that we most desperately need. And yet he is the only one in our entire lives that we will never have to perform for. His love is unconditional. Paul isn't living in the off chance that one day he might hear the words, well done, my son, you did it just right. Come and join in my happiness. Paul is living in the startling and awe-inspiring, impossible, impossible to believe reality that because of what Jesus has done on the cross, we can hear those words today that we don't have to live another day in that emptiness, in that void because of what Jesus has done. God is speaking his love over us right now. And as I considered that point, as I tried to wrap my mind around that, that because of what Jesus has done, God has drawn near to us. And he said, I love you. I've always loved you. Nothing that you could ever do will challenge the love that I have for you. I know you. I've known every one of the days that you would live before, yet one of them came to be, and I have rejoiced over you with song. I know you, and I love you. As I considered that reality, I was reminded of when I was in the hospital with my daughter Arden, right after she was born, in the, in the NICU. And I remember before they allowed us to leave the hospital, we had to sit down with a nurse because they needed to explain to us some of the developmental deficiencies that Arden might deal with in life. And as I was sitting there hearing this from the nurse, I was playing it out in my mind. And I was thinking about Arden growing up a little bit shorter than the rest of the kids, a little bit slower than the rest of the kids, a little weaker than the rest of the kids, not able to crawl as soon, not able to speak as well. I considered that eventuality in my mind. And I had this image of Arden walking up to me a little shorter, a little slower, a little weaker, and asking me, Dad, are you still proud of me? Do you still love me? Even though I don't feel lovable? Even though I'm deficient? And in that moment, as I considered that, I was overwhelmed with pride and with love for my daughter. And I thought about how ridiculous it would be for her to think that anything about her could challenge the love and the pride that I feel when I look at her. And I thought I would say to her in that moment, of course I'm proud of you. Of course I love you. Not because of what you've done. I was proud of you before you were born. Not because you're faster or stronger than the other kids, but just because you're mine. Just because you're my daughter. And I believe in that moment, that pride and that love that flooded into my heart is just one fraction of the fatherly love that God has toward us. It's not based on our development or our deficiency. It's not based on our performance. And it doesn't shy away from our failures. It's based on nothing short of the shed blood in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And so we don't work for some eternal payoff. Jesus has brought God's love to us and it's available today. And it can turn us from a bottomless pit of self-centered need. It can turn us from this human vacuum to this well that is filled up and overflowing with living water. And those are the Christians that the world needs to see because those are the Christians that look like Jesus and those are the Christians that don't need the people around them in order to feel satisfied. And so they are free from their desperate search for approval to actually know and love the people around them because they have everything that they need in the person of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul's modeling for us, the approval 
that he has, that he's operating in. It isn't just substituting God for people. Instead, he's motivated by the truth of what God says about him. And that changes absolutely everything for Paul. He knows who he is in Christ, so he's not living out of this desperate need for approval. And so there's three things that Paul talks about uh, that that allows him to do, that that frees him up to do, and we'll just run through them real quickly. Paul says, with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of opposition. Because Paul knew who he was in Jesus, he wasn't dominated by the drive for self-preservation. He didn't need to look out for himself. He didn't need to make sure that he was going to be comfortable and well taken care of because he already had everything that he needed in Jesus. And so for Paul, he can really say, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Paul talks more about this in the last two verses, verses six and seven. He says, we are not looking for praise from people, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. So not only is Paul not needing people in order to feel good about himself, but he's he's not even insisting on what he's actually owed from people. Because he knows who he is in Christ, he can relinquish his rights for the sake of others. He was content not to receive his due, because he's already received everything that he needs in Jesus. And his love and his ministry, the way that he lived his life was just an overflow of what he had already received. And finally, Paul says, instead, we were like young children among you. And the ESV translates this, we were like, uh, we were gentle among you. Paul was probably trying to contrast himself with the charlatans who would sometimes be cruel in order to get people's approval in some reverse psychology kind of way. Paul says, that's not how we lived among you. We were gentle among you. We were filled up by Jesus and that love overflowed and we just genuinely wanted to shower gentle compassion on you because of what Jesus had done in our lives. So do you see the difference that this can make in our lives? when we're not trying to use people to get something that we think that we need, when we're, when we're actually full of the love of God and we're able to give that out to the people around us? Because the difference is when we're dominated by the sphere of this world, we're living to try to fill that emptiness that we have. But when we're motivated by the truth of what God says, we live out of the love of God. We live out of what God has said about us. And what struck me, we'll just, this thought in closing, what struck me as I, as I got all this down, as I was studying the text, and I looked at these three ways of living that Paul models for us, it struck me that not only is this a better way to live, not only is this a better way to be motivated, but this is also exactly like Jesus. In Philippians 2, Paul talks about Jesus who came to this earth and humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus wasn't dominated by self-preservation. Jesus, who, who didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant so that he could come and be our all sufficient savior. Jesus relinquished his rights for our sake. And Jesus, who saw us harassed and helpless, and whose deep love drove him to the cross in our behalf. Paul's motivated by the truth of what God has said about him, and he talks about it a little differently in 2 Corinthians. Christ's love compels us, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. It was the love that Jesus expressed on the cross that motivated Paul. And so not only... Do we follow Paul's example, but we also reflect Jesus to a world that desperately needs him? And in the end, if we're going to endure through opposition and the sacred overlap, we need to remember and be motivated by that approval that God has already spoken over us because of what Jesus has done. Because when we do, we don't live out of this emptiness. We don't live in order to be filled We are filled up with the love of God and that can overflow and free us up to see and love the people around us. And the best thing that we can do today 
to live more like that tomorrow is, is to let that love wash over us. And that even though it's, it's difficult to believe at times, that we can be quiet and hear God whisper, I love you. I made you and I love you. Even though you have shortcomings, even though you're not, you're not perfect, it doesn't even touch the love that I have for you. The love that drove me to send my son to a cross to die in your place. Because when we are motivated by the love of Christ, when his love does capture our heart, then we can live faithfully as his disciples while we wait for his return. And so let's, let's pray and close out our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we confess, we confess that it's sometimes hard to hear the I love you that you've spoken to us in Jesus. We confess that sometimes it feels like we don't have eyes to see. It feels like we don't have ears to hear that. That we confess that we can, we can get so busy trying to prove our own worth, trying to get other people to love and approve of us. Lord, forgive us for trying to seek in others what we can only find in you. Forgive us for that idolatry. And Lord, out of your grace and out of your kindness, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open up our hearts to your love. As we look to Jesus on the cross, may we, may we remember the love that cast our sins as far from the east as from the west. The love that is incomprehensible. But by your power, may we grasp it nonetheless. Nonetheless. 